Okay, then uh, thanks for coming back. <laughs> um, so let me now um, continue. In particular, um, to um, <clears throat> uh, essentially starting to address what uh, I already see a question before starting. Yeah, please. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. No, they all have. But yes, but not on your physical axis. So your when you replace now time by a temperature here, you study now your icing model as a function of a of temperature, the partition function of an icing model uh, uh, as a function of temperature, now you extend the temperature to the complex plane. Actually, we see it in two, three slides, that uh, in that case, uh, no, you, indirectly you will see it on the next two, uh, two three slides, that uh, away from your physical axis, you will actually have zeros, but they will not cross your real-time axis necessarily in one dimension, for example, because there you know that you don't have a uh, phase transition at the finite temperature for a classical icing model, say. Um, so they lie somewhere in the complex plane and don't touch your physical axis where your temperature is real. But they're always there. But they also don't matter so much if they're somewhere in the complex plane and don't touch your real, uh, real axis, you also don't care so much about them. No, that's when, when these zeros now cut uh, touch your real, your real temperature axis in some way. Yes, now like, well, I would like to, um, um, to start now discussing a bit what these non-analyticities non now actually mean. So, Although I've used this terminology of a dynamical free energy density, it's important to emphasize that uh, this is uh, only a formal uh, kind of identification and does not mean that this, uh, these rate functions behave as a, a free energies in the sense that uh, you can derive uh, measurable quantities from that. For example, if you take the second derivative with, uh, of a uh, uh, of a free energy with respect to temperature, you get a specific heat, for example, so a measurable quantity. So it means if your free energy is non-analytic, you also know that a measurable quantity, like a specific heat, is non-analytic. Uh, these rate functions, or uh, dynamical free energies, as uh, in quotation marks, as I was using them, um, uh, they don't have this property that by taking derivatives, you get other measurable quantities out. So, which immediately leads to the question, uh, so what? What does it then mean if to have non-analytic behavior in this quantity? Uh, does it mean anything about uh, other physical properties that the system might have, or like quantities which we are typically measuring, like magnetizations or some local observables? Uh, do these non-analyticities non have uh, some impact at all? And all these, so these are things I would like now to address. Um, and I would like to start with um, one example, a very simple, uh, to be honest, but a very uh, instructive example where you can show that these dynamical transitions can exhibit scaling and universality in the very equilibrium sense. In that, I will show you a model where you can, uh, where you can construct an exact renormalization group transformation. Um, which allows you to show that um, this dynamical quantum phase transition is associated to, a, to an unstable fixed point, uh, which necessarily has to lead to a scaling and universality. And I will do that for the working horse of uh, many fields, which is the transverse field icing model. 
Uh, initially, the, some derivations I will show are, are very general. They are valid on any graph, on any dimension um, you would like to, like to have. So that's the model uh, I would like to study now. Um, that's the overall Hamiltonian. It has two, uh, two terms. The one is a ferromagnetic coupling of spins, which would like uh, to induce some magnetic order between spins along the sigma z direction. Um, these brackets, so like here's a small restriction. Actually, it's not really necessary for the, what comes in the following. Denote, I would like to, I use for denoting nearest neighbor uh, interactions. And the second part here is uh, a transverse field which tries to counteract uh, or compete with this uh, magnetic ordering tendency of the first term and would like to um, align the spins along transverse field direction. And in equilibrium, now these two terms compete with each other, so depending on whether the transverse field is large or small, you can have magnetic order or not, and also thermal fluctuations that you might have uh, would like to uh, destroy magnetic order. And you can lead to rich uh, phase diagrams depending on the graph you're studying or like the type of couplings you use, ferromagnetic, antiferromagnetic, and so on. Now let us study a, um, a non-equilibrium um, scenario for this, for this model and a quantum quench and a very particular one. Um, namely, a quantum quench from uh, between two very extreme limits initially in this model, um, from infinite field to zero external field. So it means infinite fields in the sense that <coughs> in the, initial, the initial Hamiltonian is dominated only by the transverse field term here. And our final Hamiltonian does not involve any transverse field and only has uh, this spin-spin coupling. Um, later on, one can uh, also go away from this extreme limit, but this, uh, this one will be particularly uh, instructive. So um, what, what does it mean? If this is the initial Hamiltonian, we choose as the initial Hamiltonian the ground, uh, as the initial state, the ground state of the, our initial Hamiltonian, which for uh, this one here is very simple, all spins pointing um, uh, along the uh, magnetic field, along sigma x direction, because I assume uh, the magnetic field to be positive here. So all spins point along the sigma x direction of the Bloch sphere. Um, now let me slightly uh, rewrite, write, let me write this initial condition in a slightly different form. So first of all, this initial condition is a product state. So each of so these, uh, uh, the, the n's, the L spins I'm considering initially, they're all uh, uncorrelated to each other. It's a product state. Overall, uh, n let, I'm sorry, now I'm using different symbols here, you know, n and L. So uh, just take them to be the same. So both of them uh, uh, give you the number of spins I'm using uh, here. So it's a product state. Um, uh, over uh, um, all the n lattice sites. And now let me represent the spin polarized along sigma x in the sigma z basis. If you do that in the sigma z basis, it's locally the um, equal superposition of spin pointing to the North Pole and to the South Pole. Um, this product, uh, this, if you multiply this out, like uh, um, explicitly uh, evaluating this uh, product here, you can immediately see that, recognize that this initial condition is uh, somehow special in that in the sigma, when S denotes a spin configuration in the sigma Z basis, this initial condition is nothing but the equal, uh, the super, equal superposition with equal weight of all possible uh, of all um, um, uh, spin configurations, okay? And that will be very important in the following. 
And now time evolution, because this is our final Hamiltonian, uh, the time evolution of our initial condition, we can, of course, formally write in this form. And now we can use a second property um, that we have in this uh, rather uh, extreme kind of quantum quench I'm discussing here, in that all the terms, like this Hamiltonian is, to some extent, classical. Uh, in the sense that um, all the operators that commute, uh, that uh, appear here uh, in this Hamiltonian, all of them mutually commute with each other. So that means that um, the exponential of that Hamiltonian can be factorized as a product of these only, uh, <coughs> only involving these two body terms. Okay? And now, these two properties of the initial condition here and of the time evolution operator for this specific Hamiltonian can be used to show the following, um, which uh, in light also of what I discussed um, in the first part of today's lecture um, is very interesting, namely that now this low Schmidt amplitude for this initial state and this final Hamiltonian is uh, uh, exactly, uh, you can rewrite exactly as the equilibrium partition function, so not a boundary partition function, but really an equilibrium partition function of a classical icing model, which lives on the same graph as the Hamiltonian I was studying before. The only difference to equilibrium here is that the effective coupling that appears, this K, is now complex and not real. That's the only difference. But apart from that, it's a conventional partition function of a classical icing model studied not along the real temperature, but on the imaginary temperature axis. Okay? And the proof is very simple. But I see it's rather, uh, it's a bit small to see. I hope you can decrypt it. So uh, proof is, uh, as I said, it's just uh, essentially a one-liner. So this is the definition of our amplitude, as you see also up there. Now we uh, use that this initial condition is the equal superposition of all spin configurations, so which gives us initially two sums, like some normalization prefactor, one over two to the power L, and then uh, two summations overall spin configurations for the uh, left and right boundary state here. But now uh, you immediately can see that, so the Hamiltonian, which is doing the time evolution in between, um, is diagonal in the sigma z basis. It, it does not induce any kind of uh, transitions. And that means that um, this here only gives, uh, is a non -zero, gives a non-zero contribution when s is equal to s prime. That's the only way, uh, only non-zero contribution. And that's what the formula here to the right-hand side is. So only a, a single sum over one spin configuration, S, S. But that's nothing than a trace in the end. And so like sum over uh, uh, um, all spin configurations and uh, the same spin configuration on the left and right-hand side is nothing else than the trace. And therefore, we have arrived already at this identification that this low Schmidt amplitude is a partition function of a classical icing model because it's a simple trace. Okay? And that is, of course, now useful because we know a, a lot about classical icing models and uh, even in the complex plane, and we can now use this knowledge to study uh, dynamical phase transitions. Um, now, as I said, actually the derivation on the previous slide is completely general. You can take, you put your icing model on any graph you would like to do. Um, but now let me uh, take a very, the most, uh, the, the most simple example one can imagine here. Um, and that is now a nearest neighbor icing model in one dimension, which uh, has this form. So only, uh, uh, spins sitting on a line and interacting 
and then this nearest neighbor way uh, long sigma z direction. So if you now, uh, this you can imagine that you can, you can imagine that one can solve this exactly and this is the result. Uh, you can focus here on this uh, brownish, uh, brownish solid line and you see that there are times here where um, the associated dynamical free energy shows these kink-like structures, so these non-analytic uh, points. So you have these dynamical transitions, and now I we would like to understand them in a bit more detail. And for that, we will now use this mapping onto this classical partition function. Um, so this, the, the partition function of the one-dimensional classical IC model in general, it can be solved using uh, the transfer matrix technique. Um, I quickly outlined it here. So here, that's our expression that uh, we derived on the previous slide. Um, now, um, let's write uh, down this uh, trace uh, explicitly as a sum over all spin configurations. This means nothing but like uh, summing uh, all, uh, all the um, L spins uh, over their two possible conf uh, orientations, plus or minus one. And um, um, depending on whether the spin, spins uh, are uh, or like I think it's straightforward to see, like we replace now these uh, operators we had here by the respective numbers uh, corresponding to the spin configuration we are summing over here. And from, from, from this, ex, uh, this expression here, you see that uh, you can uh, define now uh, for each pair of spins a matrix, which, um, I call, which is called T in general, the transfer matrix between two nearest neighboring uh, spins. And uh, you can do this for every lattice side. And these summations, uh, in the end, um, 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 are nothing um, but uh, uh, giving you a different representation that, or like, uh, are equivalent to essentially doing a matrix product of all these transfer matrices. So in the end, you can uh, rewrite the, um, this parti classical partition function in this form of, this, uh, of the transfer matrix T, and there are L of them because we have L links. I'm using periodic boundary conditions here. And all of them are the same, so, and we have L of them because we have L bonds, L lattice so we take them to the power L. And each of these, uh, or this transfer matrix is only a two by two uh, uh, matrix given by these expressions, okay? And since this matrix T is only a two by two matrix, um, you can solve, um, this partition function in the, in the thermodynamic limit easily um, just by um, searching for the eigenvalue of the transfer matrix uh, of largest magnitude. This one will dominate in the limit of L to infinity. Okay? So that's how you can solve this uh, exactly. Uh, and the exact solution you have seen actually on the previous slide. So that, in this case, the uh, low Schmidt amplitude or the uh, dynamical free energy gets these non-analyticities. But now we want to uh, use this um, representation of the partition function in terms of the transfer matrix to construct um, a renormal an exact renormalization group transformation, and a very easy one. Uh, in particular, um, a simple, uh, decimation, a real space decimation uh, transformation where we integrate out every second spin in one RG step. So initially, you have uh, uh, a set of, of spins indicated by the blue dots here, 
and they are coupled uh, initially by some coupling k, and now we want to uh, get rid of every second of these spins, and to find a new effective theory for the remaining spins, which are now uh, described in general by a new coupling, k prime. And like, if you are interested in how to, uh, in, in more details, you can, for example, have a look at this extensive review on real space RG uh, transformations for classical systems. Now, how can we do this here? And that's uh, uh, very easy. As soon as we have our transfer matrix representation, how can we implement this renormalization group transformation? So we have that uh, uh, the uh, partition function is uh, trace transfer matrix to the power L. Now let's just define a new uh, matrix T prime, which uh, we get by uh, multiplying two of these um, transfer matrices T together. If we do that, we can write our um, partition function in terms of these T, uh, T prime matrices uh, in this form, but now having only half of the uh, uh, um, uh, half of the lattice sites available, because two of them we just uh, glued together. Uh, in this way, we have eliminated every second lattice site by just doing a simple uh, matrix multiplication of this of this T matrix. Okay. Now, um, we have seen on the uh, previous slide that this T matrix um, can be related is uh, directly, uh, or is uniquely determined by this coupling key, uh, K. So by multiplying uh, these two matrices, we can associate to this new transfer matrix T prime, a new coupling T prime, uh, K prime, which uh, um, obeys the following equation. So given some coupling K initially, um, we get the new coupling K prime here of our uh, reduced spin chain by solving this equation. <coughs> um, importantly, and that's something very special about this one-dimensional nearest neighbor icing model is that this RG uh, transformation is closed and there, uh, you, that you can solve it exactly. Okay, so now uh, we have this exact recursion relation, and actually, that's not uh, given a priori, it turns out to be exactly the same recursion relation, no matter you are in equilibrium, so meaning real numbers, real uh, couplings K, or whether you have imaginary or complex couplings uh, K, as uh, they appear in this, uh, this non-equilibrium context. So this recursion relation is the same. So at this point, we don't see any difference between uh, equilibrium and non-equilibrium. Okay. Now, before uh, continuing, let's now study the fixed points of this RG transformations. So in equilibrium, you are, of course, only interested along a uh, real temperature line. But now we're actually on the, interested on the imaginary temperature line and more in, in the complex plane. So it's not clear a priori like whether there can be, for example, new fixed points appearing somewhere in the complex plane. Now, uh, if you uh, 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 want to determine uh, fixed points of this RG equation, Fixed points are those points where the coupling does not change upon uh, acting with the RG transformation on. So it means that uh, you take your uh, recursion relation and put the same K on the left and right hand side. Okay? This gives you the, uh, the fixed point. That's the defining equation. When you solve this, solve this equation, you see <coughs> that there are still only two possible solutions for fixed points. <clears throat> and they turn out to be exactly the same you find in equilibrium. So there are not, no new fixed points in the complex plane. So this does not need to be the, the case in general. For this model and this RG transformation, it seems to be the case. So in one uh, solution here of this equation is, of course, when the tange of uh, K star is equal to zero. That is a solution here. 
And this means that your uh, coupling K star is equal to zero. The other possible uh, solution to this equation is when the tange is equal to one. And this corresponds, again, to a real, <clears throat> to a real coupling, but a real coupling which is infinity. So what do, now these, what do these two different points now mean? So first of all, uh, I said they are purely real, although we started initially from complex numbers. So no matter what we do, if we st uh, start to do DRG, we will always end up in those two equilibrium fixed points. Okay? And what do these numbers now mean? Um, in equilibrium, you would, uh, this uh, K, you would, um, uh, you would have the following expression for, uh, for the coupling K, it would be the coupling divided by uh, temperature. So the K star equal zero uh, fixed point corresponds to the infinite temperature one, which is the <clears throat> boring, un uninteresting, stable fixed point of the IC model. <clears throat> and the K star infinity mean is equivalent to the zero temperature fixed point and therefore the interesting unstable one. Okay? Yes. So the, the phase you mean? So like this is the 1D classical icing chain, so it is always in a, a paramagnet at any non-zero temperature. Only at zero temperature, uh, the ground state has a ferromagnetic order, has a, a fully polarized state as its ground state. So uh, this unstable fixed point corresponds precisely to the point where <clears throat> in equilibrium all spins will be aligned, would be magnetically ordered. And Yeah, so like this is not a true phase here because it's only a singular point. So you have a magnetic order only in, at a singular point. Um, so it does not change whether you have complex numbers or not. Is that what you mean? Yes. That's true, uh, that, that's just something, uh, let me just uh, point this out, but there can be something other, uh, some other interesting thing that can happen, uh, which is not relevant here, but something in general interesting when you have complex RGs, you can get limit cycles. So you can find actually uh, solutions to this equation, uh, so like uh, solutions to the R uh, fixed points of the RG equation, by, which only appear when you, two, when you do two or three RG steps at once. So, uh, which are uh, between, for example, two, like when you do RG steps like this, which are jumping between two different uh, points in complex, in complex space. This can actually happen, but uh, it's not relevant here. That's why I don't uh, go into detail. But something interesting which cannot appear uh, in, in the case of real couplings. But these are the only ones, only fixed points here for that equation, and these are the ones which are relevant for what I will discuss in the day. Okay, so now uh, coming back um, to uh, the data I've shown you. So like here, uh, I told you that you should look at this uh, brown solid line and that there were points in time here, here and here where, they have be where you observe kinks from the exact solution. And these points are located, or the first one here, is located at uh, a value of the uh, dimensionless coupling k uh, i pi over 4, turns out. So now let's uh, study what uh, uh, happens to this coupling when we uh, do the RG transformation. So when you take uh, i pi over 4 and compute the tangent of it, you find it's i. Okay, so that's our starting point. Now let's do the RG transformation. The RG transformation is taking just the square, <clears throat> the square of this tangent to get the new tangent. So the, ten, the square of, uh, of i is minus 1. So after one RG step, 
we are at a new coupling, uh, which is given by tanj equal to minus one. And now we do a second RG step. And the square of minus one is one. So uh, we get that tanj of k flows to plus one. And when we do more of RG steps, you, we will stay there, of course. And remarkably, it is the uh, value of the unstable fixed point. So the, uh, in other words, the uh, dynamical quantum phase transition, which happens at this kc uh, equal to i pi over four is a critical point which flows to the unstable fixed point of the uh, one-dimensional icing model. And in this very equilibrium sense, uh, it's an unstable fixed point that has to show scaling and universality. You can take uh, uh, all the knowledge you have from equilibrium here. Um, and for example, you can check uh, whether the universal scaling form of the dynamical free energy uh, 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 is consistent. So you, let's define a distance to the critical point, which is here, uh, not a distance in terms of like a, a temperature distance to the critical point, but rather a, tempor uh, a temporal distance. And uh, like when you take the prediction from uh, universal scaling, you would, you would say that this um, and dynamical free energy is given by this expression. Dimension here, d is equal to one. The, uh, the um, exponent lambda you can compute from your RG uh, uh, equation. You find it's also one. So uh, you will find, you find that this G uh, or the singular contribution to the, to the free energy has this absolute value tau behavior where tau is the distance to the critical point. And that's precisely the kink we have observed on, from the exact solution. So everything is consistent. Please, there was a question. Yes. Um, so, like that's that's the result from 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 the exact from the exact calculation that you find that there is a non-analytic behavior at this point. Yes, and now we st now we study um, uh, how this critical uh, point behaves under the RG. Yes, yes, yes. 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 No, 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 no. What changes uh, remarkably is the structure of these limit cycles that I mentioned. <laughs> but the other things do not change. So now, um, like this, now what I, what I told you somehow uh, establishes on a rigorous way that these dynamical transitions, at least for our particular models, can obey scaling and universality. Uh, here for a one-dimensional uh, IC model. Now, uh, actually the mapping of the, of this Lohschmidt amplitude to a classical partition function, which was much more general, um, for, say two dimensions or three dimensions, we cannot construct an exact RG anymore for that. Uh, can, cannot be done. However, what we can do uh, still is uh, we can use the Onsaga solution for the 2D icing model, but now adapted to complex couplings. You have to be careful at a few steps when you, in particular when you select the dominant eigenvalue, um, but you can uh, compute then the uh, uh, partition function free energy uh, density exactly for the two-dimensional case. And you find that there is, uh, again, uh, a critical uh, point in time, a dynamical quantum phase transition in the 2D model, 2D icing model. And uh, from uh, the exact solution, you find that the non-analytic behavior has uh, this form, tau square log tau, where tau is the distance to the critical point. And remarkably, that's exactly the same scaling as the, as, uh, the two-dimensional icing model at its finite temperature critical point, which also has scaling and universality. 
uh, we cannot prove uh, anything further. We only can uh, show that uh, at least we, are, we get the same scaling uh, of the non-analytic behavior as for the equilibrium finite temperature critical point of the 2D icing. Yes. We also tried to do three dimensions, but we failed. We cannot say anything about that. Okay. Good. So, yes, please. Um, you have to be, no, 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 I cannot do that. You have to be careful in the following, following, uh, following way that um, this um, Lohschmidt amplitude looks like a partition function of a particular system, but this is only formal. It does not mean that uh, this is the action, like, um, how should I say that? Um, for example, here we are mapping the Lohschmidt amplitude to a classical partition function of the same dimension, not uh, dimension d plus one, as you would typically do mapping quantum classical. Here it's really the same dimension. Uh, we are, the actual quantum dynamics is not a one dimension classical icing model. There's more to that. So like, uh, for example, it does not make sense now to, um, so if I were now to, um, to measure spin-spin correlations, the dynamics of my spin-spin correlation function in this quantum quench protocol, I would not find a divergent correlation length. It's only um, that this Lohschmidt amplitude uh, has a behavior uh, as a one-dimensional classical icing model with a divergent correlation length. It's only the Lohschmidt amplitude. If I uh, study the, uh, the dynamics of, in this quantum quench of, the, of correlations or uh, local observables, uh, that's a different issue. Okay, so more clear? And that's also something uh, which I will discuss later on in more detail. So yeah, one has to be careful to distinguish to those two things a bit. And I will also discuss a bit in uh, the connection to entanglement later. Yes. I will tell you later. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, I will tell you later precisely why I think one should uh, associate uh, or think of it as a quantum a phase trans transition precisely in the sense that uh, um, you can think of it as a dynamical analog to a quantum phase transition. Uh, or let me, let me make this uh, a sh short statement why. Um, in that um, the, what the Lohschmidt amplitude is doing for you, it's taking the full time evolved state and projects it onto the initial state. The initial state is a ground state by construction in this quantum quench scenario. So, uh, since it's the ground state, the Lohschmidt amplitude probes the ground state, manif like the dynamics of your time evolved state in some ground state of some Hamiltonian. And I will show you how you can use this to define analogs of critical regions, which draw a direct analogy to uh, what you would typically think of quantum phase transitions. But tomorrow. Yes?
So which kind of fluctuation theorems are you thinking about? Jajinsky or? Uh, uh, um yeah, there is um, some uh, relation in the sense that uh, the Fourier transform of the Lohr-Schmidt amplitude is actually the work distribution function. So in some way, or like the, um, the Jajinsky relation is related, or I think there's not a deep relation in the end. Uh, but maybe as a, a small, a nice analogy, because I was discussing complex partition functions here, the Zerzhinsky uh, uh, equality is actually nothing but uh, the low Schmidt amplitude somewhere in the complex, complex time plane. And uh, in this way, also the Zerzhinsky relation is hidden in all this complex partition function structure here. Um, but I don't, we have tried to connect or like tried to see whether uh, signatures of these dynamical transitions appear in work distribution functions, but it's tricky. And therefore, there's nothing which relates them to Georgienski or anything like this. Yeah, please. Yes. Yes, you can, like, again, uh, not in general, but we know for classes of models how to define order parameters, which uh, change uh, as a function of time at this particular point. For example, there's a, there are also actually, <laughs> I think precisely on that, there are three or four experiments which use that. And what they show is that you can, uh, that when you have um, um, study quantum quenches in systems which uh, involve Hamiltonians that have topological, uh, uh, topologically non trivial ground states, that you can develop some. For example, uh, some vortices in in uh, in the uh, vortices in some phase profiles. I will come to that. And these vortices appear suddenly, uh, precisely at dynamical phase transitions. So, in the number like the number of vortices you can take then as an order parameter, you will see them. You can think of them then as an order parameter. So you m monitor like this particular phase profile and then you see at some particular point in time suddenly um, pairs of vortices uh, appear in this phase profile and you can measure them and use them as an order parameter. But for that particular uh, dynamical transition I was discussing here, uh, I cannot tell you an order parameter. I don't know it. Yes. Sorry. Ah, so like for this one-dimensional transfer speed icing model, that's overall exactly solvable. Even without, even like I've I've discussed here only a very particular point, uh, uh, quenching from infinite to zero field. You can solve it exactly by Jordan Wigner transformation. Uh, um, for any value of fields and um, uh, couplings. <coughs> oh, sorry. And there, um, like, and that's actually data you see up here. I don't, not only see it for one, one value of the transverse fields, but for different ones. And for this particular model, you see that they um, occur, these uh, non analyticities occur periodically on and on and on until infinity. But that's, I guess, uh, my guess is that this is um, uh, a consequence of the exact solvability of the model. As soon as you add sufficiently generic interactions, uh, at some point, uh, this has to change. So at short times, uh, they can still survive. That's somehow related to a certain robustness of these uh, transitions. But at long times, they might not be robust. It might change the nature. Uh, please. Yeah. 
Uh, so uh, maybe let, let's, let me take the chance here to uh, make some f actual uh, further analogy here. Yeah? I think um, what this analogy, uh, dualities are also doing, one way of thinking maybe about them is to match high and low temperature expansions. Um, what I think um, for this one dimension, yeah, no, I think I, I don't, I cannot do a general statement here, but uh, I think. It, like high and low temperature would correspond like a short time and some time here or some later time here, expansion about one or the other points. And I think the, I, I would guess there should be a, a also a duality, but I, I've not thought deeply about that. One, one would have to check it. So, Actually, so since there are only a few minutes left, I'm done with this one part. I'm, I think it does not make sense to start with the next one, which is now on the uh, uh, experiment that I was showing you before. I think I would uh, rather stop now and uh, let you have a longer afternoon for yourself. Thank you very much.